The following program is brought to you free of charge by the sponsorship of Novos Ordo Watch. See for yourself that the Church of the Second Vatican Council is not in fact the Catholic Church of the Ages. Go to NovosOrdoWatch.org. Well, Your Excellency, it's been many years since we sat down for this series in what I had thought was a series we would complete soon after. It was actually April of 2013 when we recorded these first three episodes, and now here it is, almost April of 2022, and we're going to finish this History of Christendom series. A lot has passed during this time particularly because this episode is going to focus on the French Revolution. And since April of 2013, you and I have been working in France numerous times. I've been living in France, so I've had a chance to see the effects of the revolution up close. And I think what we're going to start with in today's episode is the perception of the French Revolution, what we're taught in school and what the French are taught in school, what is graven into all of their government buildings, is that this was the most wonderful thing that's, that's ever happened to us, Your Excellency. Yes, it has been canonized by the modern world. Um, the, the popular explanation of it is that uh, Louis XVI was a dissolute uh, idiot uh, and had a, a horrible wife and uh, that uh, he oppressed the peasants and that he... Um, uh, didn't care uh, anything at all for them, and that uh, they uh, decided the peasants. It was a peasant revolt that decided to rise up against the king, and uh, they uh, Louis, Marie Antoinette came out and said, "Let them eat cake," and then they took the king to Paris and eventually cut off his head. That is the popular uh, version of it, and it is as false as false could be. Uh, so it, it's um, yeah. I think the only true thing you said just now, Your Excellency, was his head was cut off. Yes. <laughs> well, they did bring him to Paris, <laughs> but all the rest of it is just popular nonsense. It is. It, it's. Uh, it was something inspired by the devil, uh, and it was carried out by the enemies of the church, namely the Freemasons, and the uh, Philosophes, and all of the the 18th century anti-Catholic thinking was in it, and uh, it was uh, a revolt primarily against the church and the Catholic religion established in France, and a revolt against authority in general. For those who are unfamiliar with Freemasonry and the Philosophes, His Excellency just alluded to, we covered this extensively in our last episode, so I would refer you to that to get a more footnotes, you could say, on the idea of Free, the ideas of Freemasonry and some of these horrible characters like Rousseau, Diderot, Voltaire, etc. One of the ideas behind the revolution, Your Excellency, is in a sense a delayed reaction from Protestantism. When you had the Protestant revolt, we had a localized problem in Germany with Protestantism and Catholicism and some knock-on effects in other parts of Europe. But realistically, that wasn't going to be good enough they needed to attack the heart of Christendom, and what better place than the eldest daughter of the church? Yes, France was uh, at the time uh, a very rich country, a very powerful country, uh, and had an immense cultural influence upon Europe. Everyone regarded France as the source of all culture and refinement, and uh, so it was the, the place in which to make a revolution. I made reference to the fact that they have graven their values onto government buildings, and those are the ideas of liberté, égalité, fraternité, liberty, equality, fraternity. And this is used by almost all politicians in France. They're accepted as the Republican values, small r, Republican, 
values. And I think it might be helpful as English speakers, we might say, well, I understand liberty, equality, fraternity, but it might make sense for you to explain what those really mean, Your Excellency, in terms of what the revolution means when they say those things. Yes, they sound like innocent things, uh, but they are not innocent in the context of the French Revolution. Liberty for them mean, and this is stated directly in the Declaration of the Rights of Man, is that human beings are free to do whatever they want, provided it does not harm another. That is a very evil doctrine, because we are not permitted to do whatever we want. Uh, so it favors, for example, all sorts of immorality, personal immorality. That is the, as long as you're not hurting anyone, the, the grossest forms of sin it it will uh it will give its blessing to uh so the you have to understand that it, it, liberty is the freedom the way it is defined by saint thomas is the freedom to choose the means while always retaining the end to be attained so the uh, for example, uh, if you were to drive from, say, here in Florida to Atlanta, there are many different ways to take. So you are free to choose among the various ways, but your, uh, your goal always remains Atlanta. So you, we uh, therefore have always uh, in morality the goal of, of obedience to the commandments of God, to the natural law, which is essentially the same thing. We cannot change those things. Uh, we, uh, therefore, there, uh, there are certain things which are demanded of us by law and certain things that are up to our freedom of choice. So, for example, where we will live or what kind of job we will have. All of those things we may choose because there are many ways in which to please God by where we live or what job we have, what vocation we have in life, etc., so there are, the, the church always makes the distinction between due freedoms, and those things that are due to man uh, and are, are perfectly legitimate freedoms and upholds those freedoms, but it cannot uphold the idea that we are free to do whatever we please as long as it does not hurt somebody else. Essentially, if you don't rob banks and shoot people, well, then you can do pretty much whatever you want. That is a, a the, it's the, it is known as the freedom of license. Uh, St. Augustine calls it the freedom of perdition. And so it's an evil doctrine. But that is what animates the, the entire modern world. I mean, this, the, the French Revolution is still having its effect. It, it has not stopped. It, ha it has turned the world upside down since uh, 1789. And... Uh, uh, it uh, is the cause of all of the other ills that we have today, uh, namely socialism and particularly socialism. But uh, so that's that's freedom. So it totally perverted the notion of freedom. <clears throat> the Catholic Church has always been the friend of free will and has always defended the free will of man against Protestants and various other heretics. But the, the uh, um, Luther de denied free will, as a matter of fact. Uh, and uh, so the church has always been the proponent of the notion of free will. It is also true that even when we obey the commandments of God, we are free as we elect to do that. We know the law and we elect to obey the law. We are always free in whatever we do, provided we're not asleep or drunk or in some way impaired mentally see but we're always free uh, so you know this but this french revolution notion of freedom is something totally new and it is directly from the pits of the philosophs you know the, the these so-called enlightenment philosophers who thought up all of these pagan ideas and then equality meant that uh we're all equal before the law well you know, that doesn't sound too bad, but it was meant to destroy the aristocracy, that there was a certain class of people uh, that had privileges, that, uh, that they had um, a different set of laws and were tried in different courts, etc. Uh, and so the idea was everyone is equal. 
that is uh, one of the cardinal dogmas of socialism, that we are all equal, uh, that not only are we equal by all having human nature, which is true, but we are equal in every single thing. And we can see that now in all of the movements, like the, uh, the BLM movements and, and, and um, socialism in general, that, uh, that you see, socialism sees uh, the, the, everyone as being just an individual, a free individual. I compare it to a bag of marbles. And, and they, each person, despite whatever merits he may have, whatever intelligence he may have, whatever work he does, each person is equal. And the state must keep everybody equal. There cannot be any kind of rise of one person above another. Okay, so it's not a meritocracy. It, it is a, a, something like a steamroller keeping everybody equal. That's socialism. That's the soul of socialism. And, uh, and then you get this omnipotent state keeping everybody equal. Um, so that, that's the, the sense of equality in that word, that, that egalité. The, the, uh, uh, it is not, a, again, a due equality. The, the, the equality uh, of the Catholic Church is that everyone is equal at the communion rail, and the king has to kneel down at the same communion rail as the pauper, both in need of, of the graces of Holy Communion. Uh, they're, they're, they're equals in the confessional. <laughs> they both have to confess their sins. That is true equality, uh, that uh, we are all servants of God. But it, it, that it is an entirely healthy thing in a society and a natural thing in a society that some people rise above others because of their different qualities and abilities. And isn't it interesting that in this society in which we live in the United States, which repudiates titles, it's in the Constitution, no lords or dukes or anything like that, but we have an aristocracy that manages to escape prosecution in any of their crimes. Do you notice that? That these people the, uh, commit all kinds of horrible crimes, po politicians, corruption galore, and no one is ever prosecuted for it. They live in an arist aristocratic world. They don't have titles, but they are aristocrats, and they are untouchable by the law. And uh, fraternity means... Uh, doing away with the mystical body of Christ, the church which united all of Europe uh, and which in its unity of faith unites people all over the world uh, and continues to do so. Uh, the, it is to replace that with Freemasonic brotherhood, that we're all brothers because we are uh, all human beings uh, and uh, therefore there should be a type of natural charity, we should be nice to each other, etc., uh, the, um, the Beethoven's Ninth Symphony uh, touts that, and it's no mistake that the uh, Ode to Joy, which is full of that uh, natural, uh, naturalistic brotherhood, is the national anthem of the EU, the European Union. There's so much that you, you commented on there. Your Excellency, I'm, I'm going to try to limit myself to, to two or three points. The, the first is regarding equality for some context for those who are not familiar with French history. There were, there were some tensions here insofar as the nobility were exempt from taxation, but the idea was that they would have to levy the, and, and carry the costs of warfare. But the French nobility had not gone to war for a long time, but they were still tax exempt. This created some resentment, and it seemed that they used their privilege, as you alluded to, to get out of numerous wrongdoings, and, and this did cause some resentment at a lower level. Well, it is true that French society was not perfect, uh, and there was need of reform. Absolutely, it was true. The, the French society and European society of the 18th century was still living on the medieval plan, and that is great castles surrounded by serfs, uh, people with a lot of money that had the ability to buy armor and have horses and to go to war for the king uh, when necessary. That was the idea of, of aristocracy. Uh, they were the ones that had to go to war. The serfs did not have to go to war. It was the knights and the, and the aristocracy. 
uh, because they had the money to buy those things. And uh, so they, there was a, that system was still there and it, it did not pay attention to the rise of the middle class. The middle class wanted to see to a great extent the French Revolution because they had no place. It was either the aristocracy or the peasant and they were listed among the peasants. So really the, the French monarchy should have understood the social changes that were going on, economic changes that were going on in the 18th century and made whatever changes necessary in order to do that. Unfortunately, you had, after Louis XIV died in 1715, you had a, a, a Louis XV who reigned for a long time uh, from 1715 to 1774 who was a dissolute. I mean, he would, uh, there was no woman that was safe around him, let's put it that way, and uh, spent an awful lot of his time in just a complete uh, dissipation and lost a great many wars. Uh, I don't think they won a single war under Louis XV. Uh, they had a disaster of, a, of a, a loss in the Seven Years' War, which ended in 1756 and uh, they lost all of their North American colonies, uh, all sorts of terrible uh, setbacks. And so he was you know, busy with women and, and hunting and various other pastimes while he should have had his eye on the social changes going on in France. Also, he should have kicked out of France all of these philosophes, these liberal-minded pagan uh, filthy uh, uh, people like Rousseau and like all Montalembert, uh, not Montalembert, D'Alembert, and uh, others that were attacking the faith and attacking morals. Um, and uh, the only one he got rid of was Voltaire. <clears throat> and uh, but the others were very active in France, so they were spreading around all of this these ideas. Uh, and then you had Louis the Sixteenth coming in 1774 who was never meant to reign. His brother was supposed to reign, his older brother, but his older brother died and he became suddenly the heir. Uh, his older, bro other, older brother died of smallpox. And uh, so he was a, he was not a womanizer at all. He was a fervent Catholic, uh, but of, of the time, a liberal tendency, of a certain liberal tendency, a weak uh, and uh, indecisive. He was not the man of the moment. Uh, and uh, he, he was is not a competent leader of such a great country. And so, of course, all of the forces of evil uh, made the most of that. And uh, there were, yes, uh, he didn't make reforms. There was certain, uh, there was uh, uh, even the, you know, the peasants were upset about certain laws, etc., that, that were oppressive to them. He should have made all kinds of reforms. He made the, the disastrous decision to help the United States gain uh, independence from England, and uh, which caused a tremendous economic crisis in France which in turn uh, got things rolling toward a revolution. Uh, and uh, so the, uh, the, uh, that, that's the, uh, the background of the French Revolution. Well, and as you say, one of the ways that you can keep touch with social changes is to be in contact with the people. But when Louis XVI called the Estates General, it had been 150 or more years since the Estates General had been called. You have generations of people who don't even know what this is. It turns into a weapon for the philosophes to mm -hmm. beat the monarchy over the head with, or, well, uh, take the head off. Yes, yes. The, uh, he, um, uh, you see, the, the medieval idea was that there was an Estates General, a type of parliament, uh, where the, the, there was an airing of the thoughts and, and desires of the people before the king uh, and his ministers uh, so that the king was in contact with his country that way. And uh, it would meet from time to time according to the pleasure of the king, but it, it was something that was, was done. Uh, but Louis XIII, uh, who, who died in the early 1640s, 
was the, the last one to call it, and Louis XIV was the great absolutist king, uh, and, and, uh, which actually was a Protestant principle. Uh, and he uh, never bothered to call it, and uh, Louis XV and Louis XVI never bo bothered to call it either. Also, uh, Louis XIV uh, replaced the nobility, he built Versailles in order to bring the nobility to the area of Paris and, and with him in the same palace to quote-unquote help him govern France. He couldn't care less about what they thought. But that, the idea was, help me govern France, and all they did was party uh, and gossip. Uh, and he governed France through, the, um, through his royal agents. See, so there was a, a, a centralization of power. Uh, and you know, though that may not bad, be bad in itself, uh, nonetheless, there was a, 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 an insensitivity to what was going on in the provinces. Uh, yes, the, the nobility were exempt of taxes. Uh, that was a holdover from the Middle Ages. Uh, those nobles probably wouldn't know what a sword looked like in, in uh, 1789. Uh, they were busy with their wigs and everything else. Well, they, was, they found out what swords look like. Yes, they found out finally. But... Uh, you know, yes, there was there was uh, uh, there was need of social change, uh, need of economic change, uh, and um, but you know, no government is perfect, no social situation is perfect in any country, and in order to um, uh, you know, you can't say well because things were not perfect, therefore we should have a revolution. Uh, all of those things could have been addressed in a much more intelligent way. There was a, the all of those evils were simply an occasion for revolution. They wanted revolution. They did not really want to fix the evils. They wanted to overthrow the Catholic monarchy, the establishment of the Catholic faith in France. They wanted to completely transform France into a secularistic society. Obviously, we have an international audience that's watching this, Your Excellency, but I can't avoid the fact that we're recording it in the United States, and uh, people who consider themselves conservative in this country, they, they like the idea of revolution, they cheer the American Revolution, revolution's a good thing, they sort of threaten these things when the, the government has gotten more oppressive, but it should be noted that as Catholics, that's not the, the, f the first idea of plan A, it's not plan B, it's not plan C, it's the absolute last possible thing that we would want to resort to normally. Yes, unfortunately, uh, American conservatives see the principles of the Declaration of Independence and the, some principles in the Constitution as being ideal and that the uh, present uh, tendency of the country is to not be faithful to those principles. L let me explain this. The, the principles of 1776 and of 1789 in this country, that's the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, are the principles of 18th century liberalism. That is, we are free as birds to do whatever we please as long as we don't hurt someone else. There is, uh, in the Constitution, there is not even a mention of God. He is absolutely absent. So you have this country that is organized on the basis of uh, a, a godless society. The, that, that is national suicide because your laws therefore are not subject to any morality how do you obtain morality there is not even mention of the natural law in the constitution so you have a from the point of view of morality a headless society that is is capable of anything also the the uh, liberalism leads to socialism and and that's what what uh, is is not understood by the average American. The system that was set up in 1789, 1776, was the system of liberalism, uh, freedom. You can see it in all of the culture of the time, the cult of freedom, uh, the Statue of Liberty, which is much later, but still the, the, uh, all of the money, you know, Miss Liberty, and the flags of liberty, liberty, liberty. That was the, the false notion of liberty that I explained from the uh, philosophes in France. 
It came th from France through Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Paine and other people who were in contact with those horrid creatures. Benjamin Franklin as well, uh, uh, who, uh, uh, were, you know, who was in France for a long time. Uh, uh, they brought all of those ideas over and also from England. England was loaded with those ideas too. So the idea of, of being totally free to, to do whatever you want uh, except what is uh, going to hurt someone else. Well, that invites this. It invites gross immorality, but at the same time, it gives to the government the idea of what hurts somebody else. You see, who's going to decide what hurts somebody else? And that's what the, the French Revolution, the, the Declaration of the Rights of Man, says that what hurts somebody else is up to the law. It's right in it. See, so it makes the government all powerful and the government has no, no God above it, is, is accountable to no one. Uh, uh, and and uh, is, is able to do whatever it pleases. So it goes, it has all of the evils of absolutism, those regal absolutism, all of the evils of it, because it, it had at least, Louis XIV was at least Catholic. He, he had some sort of moral guide in his head. If you get people in there that have no respect for the natural law and are just pagans, well, you have what we have. We have the murdering of babies. I mean, how could anyone think that that is something good or is something acceptable, that little babies get murdered in the wombs of their mothers? But there's no law to, to, to stop that because there's no God in our Constitution. There is no morality. There's no code of morality. And so the, that, all of that liberalism leads to a super state that will decide what is good and what is not good. And that's why we have socialism because of liberalism. Liberalism sees everyone as equal and that's why the state reaches down beyond the father of the family and reaches all the way to the children, gets into the schools, teaches the, the children whatever the state thinks is right and regardless of what the parents want. That is the effect of liberalism because it makes the state supreme and invasive. And Americans don't realize that. They see freedom, they think wonderful freedom, but when you give when when you when you give assent to that form of freedom, you are asking for socialism and we've got it. I and I, that's the irony your excellency is those people who are let's say originalists, they want to get back to the founders intent, don't see that there is a straight line that connects our society to that. If we go back to Founders' intent, we'll just start the game back from the beginning and get back to exactly where we are now. They don't see that the society we have now is a result of the Founders, not in, in spite of the Founders. They were mostly Freemasons, the, the Founders, Deists, people who were virtual atheists, and also the Declaration of the Rights of Man of the French Revolution drew their ideas in, in great part from the constitutions of New Hampshire and Virginia. And we have a straight line from the Declaration of the Rights of Man to the UN sort of declarations. Of... Yes, yes. So the other comment about equality is the idea, the ideas behind the, the French Revolution's idea of equality seem to ask us to ignore the natural order, the supernatural order. Clearly, there are people who have been given more natural gifts by God. Clearly, there, Our Lady was given more supernatural gifts, St. Thomas. We, we would seem to have to close our eyes to reality to accept this premise of, of equality broadly, other than, as you say, the equality of we all have to kneel at the communion rail to receive our Lord. We all have to go to confession. That, that's the equality that, that a Catholic can understand. But this, these, what would lead to in our, our, our modern parlance, equality of outcome is complete lunacy. It is. It's, it's uh, lunacy. That's the only word for it. It denies the natural order, which uh, is diverse. You know, it, 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 people have, some people have more talents than others. Some people have particular talents, such as technology, others art. But when you just lump everyone together as being all equal, uh, you, you really destroy the natural order. 
there need to be mechanisms to enforce the ideas of liberty, equality, and fraternity, and they are they are ideas that we simply take for granted, things that we are, t again, taught in schools, not just in America, but around the world, and they are liberty of religion, liberty of the press, and liberty of speech. Why aren't these wonderful, great things, Your Excellency? Yes, again, American political conservatives hold these things up as being ideal. In fact, the, the Roman Catholic Church condemns those liberties. Uh, Leo XIII was explicit about them. Uh, the only religion that should be free to function and have a right to function is the true religion. Uh, falsehood has no rights. Uh, falsehood is, is non-existence. When, when you say something false, you're saying something that doesn't exist. You know, if I say this, the sky is, is, is a different color from what it is, it, that means it, it doesn't exist as that. The, so falsehood has no rights. The only thing that has right, rights is the truth. So the, the true religion is the only one that should be uh, permitted. Now, yes, the church does say that in certain societies where there's a, an abundance of a difference of religion, other religions could be tolerated. See, that means toleration means... You don't actually permit it, but you just look the other way. There's, there's a, a certain, uh, you know, those, in order to preserve peace, uh, because especially in a very large country like our own, there are many, many different peoples with many different religions. But toleration is a whole other thing from freedom. That is a right. A right comes from God. It is a blasphemy to say that God gives a right to be wrong that God gives false religions a right to exist and to worship him in a false manner. A right is rooted in God. And it is, a, we call a right, a moral faculty, an ability to do something, and obviously the ability to do something good. You can never have a right to do something evil. But if something is contrary to, a false, to, a, to the true religion, it is necessarily false and therefore evil. So you can't, cannot give it a right to exist. So this idea of freedom of religion, I am free to, to accept and practice and, and propagate whatever religion I please, is something contrary even to, to reason from what I just said. So it is condemned by the Catholic Church. Freedom of the press, again, only truth has rights. And believe it or not, the... You know, there's a great outcry against censorship. It was the leftists in the 19th century who were agitating against censorship because the governments in the mid-19th century had the common sense to repress the liberal and communist and socialist errors of the leftists. They couldn't print it. And all these rotten leftists of the 19th century were always, always clamoring against censorship. So in 1848, a lot of the, that was one of the revolutions of the 19th century, a lot of the censorship of the government was lifted. And that just gave way for a whole flood of worse errors. You see, the, the naturalistic attitude of Freemasonry and, and uh, the French Revolution, the philosophes, is to deny the effects of original sin. And the idea is that if human beings uh, are presented with falsehood and truth, uh, they will necessarily choose the truth. See, so if they read this, they read this, they read this, well, they'll decide which one is true and, and proceed with the truth. That is not true. <laughs> the history of humanity is one of error after error and, and moral collapse after moral collapse, it is not good at picking out the truth. It, it, is, it is loaded with error. And so that's why censorship in itself is good. That's the, the, in other words, if it is the protection of the truth, objective truth. But again, if you say there is no established religion uh, and, and there, therefore who's to say what the truth is? And uh, so therefore you can't censor anybody. See, that's liberty. And then the same thing is true of freedom of speech. Speech is made for the truth. God gave you the faculty of speech to say the truth. He didn't give it to you to say falsehood. 
Therefore, you have no right from God to say anything false. And we also know that speech is very powerful. How did Hitler come to power? Except through speeches. He had the gift of, of, of uh, fomenting uh, uh, movement in, in, a, in a crowd. Uh, and, and many other great speakers uh, were the, the cause of, of, of great evils in the world. It's a very dangerous thing to, to have the gift of, of speech. And sp uh, uh, bad speech can do an awful lot of evil. And no, it, only the truth has rights. And what happened? When the left gets into power, what do they do? They censor, <laughs> which is typical. <laughs> Why? Because it's natural. They're going to say the left is, is the truth. Therefore, what is against the left is false and it should be repressed. Of course it should be if the left is the truth. Of course, and they understand that. They understood that back in the 19th century. <coughs> Their idea of freedom of speech and freedom of the press, that was just an excuse to usher in their evil ideas and then once in power to turn that upon us, to, to censor us and to repress us. So these are very false and dangerous ideas. And that's the strange part, Your Excellency, is even so in France and in the United States, it seems everybody accepts these as the starting point. Yes. So if, they're, if you're intellectually aligned, then any other differences are really just imaginary. Mm -hmm. so the so-called yes. far right in France accepts all of these Republican values. Yes. So where can you go from there? No, it, the system is essentially flawed. And we'll never really come out of its problems until those essential flaws are eliminated. Part of the system becoming institutionalized comes from Napoleon. So a nest of contradictions, this man, universal conscription, the Napoleonic Code, a concordat with the church, which he then doesn't observe, uh, nepotism, which we were supposed to be saved from, democracy was going to save us from that. Any relative of his, if you were a relative of Napoleon's, you could rule a country. It didn't matter what experience you had. And so what does it mean to institutionalize the revolution? And, and obviously Napoleon's an enormous subject, so I, I would just ask some brief comments on him, Your Excellency. Well, simply that he went to in, into all of those conquered countries and uh, went to work imposing all the principles of the revolution which i just described uh the uh, uh gallicizing that means making like france uh, every place that he went to and the the uh, uh getting rid of the aristocracy and and uh, establishing uh uh constitutions that were full of all those evil principles uh that's what he did and and all of conquered europe uh, and that was all done away with with the Congress of Vienna in 1814. They restored the original uh, order of Europe in 1814. But he had already, I, I compare it to uh, a manure spreader. He, he, uh, he was a manure spreader in Europe. Uh, the, uh, have you ever seen a manure spreader? It's like a fan on top of a pile of manure that a, a farmer drags you know with a tractor through his his uh, his uh, vineyard or wherever and it sprays manure everywhere and that's exactly what napoleon did he 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 sprayed the manure of of the french revolution throughout all of continental europe and uh just made every uh, uh and and you know despite all of his imitation of monarchy and imitation as he made himself an absolute monarch and and practiced all of the things that were detested in the monarchy uh, he uh, nevertheless was totally in favor of the revolution and and was a jacobin that means a, a radical revolutionist when he was uh, during during the revolution uh, and uh, praised the revolution right on his deathbed hmm. So the, you know, he never gave up his devotion to the French Revolution. But yes, I mean, he, was, he, he had all of the worst aspects of the revolution and of monarchy. <clears throat> well, one of those bad aspects of monarchy, which we, we've seen with Barbarossa and other predecessors, is the idea of the church as a creature of the state. 
that it's something to be used. And we saw this, we could say backfire a little bit uh, to insist that Pius uh, it, crown him in Paris. Well, it turns into a triumphal procession as everybody turns out to see the Holy Father on his way. This is long before the international travels of the Pope and uh, Napoleon got a bit jealous of all the attention the Holy Father got. But then he still gets one over on the Holy Father by crowning himself, insisting that these would be the rubrics that would be followed, again, dictating to the church the, her own ceremonies. And then, of course, the controversial concordat which to this day is still disputed by some traditional Catholics in France, not as to whether um, he had the authority to do it as the Holy Father, but whether it was wise. And uh, I'm aware that this can get into some controversial territory, Your Excellency, but can you at first tell our, our viewers what is a concordat and why was this concordat so contentious and so problematic? Well, a concordat is a, an agreement between the Vatican and a state, meaning a nation, uh, where the, uh, there is a modus vivendi, that means a, a way of living together. Uh, certain things are conceded, certain things are not conceded by the church, and vice versa with the state. Uh, so it's an agreement, essentially. I think that was the first concordat uh, that uh, I think that's where the name uh, arose. There were many other concordats after that in the 19th century, but uh, that was uh, the first one. And uh, uh, my opinion is that it was a mistake. Uh, the, Pius VII, you have to understand, was uh, as a young priest and uh, in the 17 mid 1700s. Uh, liberal. Uh, he had a. He was uh, in favor. He gave uh, actually a welcome to the uh, French troops invading Italy in 1799, and uh, he, you know, which eventually, who eventually overran Rome and and imprisoned Pius VI, uh, and brought him to France where he died. Uh, and uh, so you know he was. Uh, uh, you would call him a liberal. Um, and uh, so he, he had he entertained uh, ideas that were favorable to to the revolution. Um, I wouldn't call him a radical, but he entertained ideas of that nature. He was elected in 1800 in Venice as someone to make peace with the revolution. Uh, they knew his reputation, and they thought we can make peace with this animal of the revolution. And so that was the nature of the Concordat. Consalvi, who was his right-hand man, was the representative in Paris, and he too had ideas of that nature. And I think they, they gave away the store, as they say. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, and I, I won't go into the details about it, but I think there were many concessions that should not have been made. I think that the very idea of making peace with a Jacobin uh, was faulty, in my opinion. Uh, I think that the church should have, at that point, realized that it, is, it was living as if among the Roman Empire again, it was living among persecutors, uh, emperor persecutors, and that it had to go through a, another stage of persecution. Uh, instead, it it wanted to make peace, I call that concordat the baptism of the revolution. Uh, now, you know, people might <laughs> very vehemently dis disagree with me, but I... I, I mean, it's, it's um, <laughs> memorialized inside the Madeleine yeah. in Paris. Uh, and uh, I think it gave rise to something called liberal Catholicism in France. Um, um, Lamennais, Felicité de Lamennais, he was a priest who eventually apostatized. Uh, liberal Catholicism, that is, the free church in a free state, uh, I think it gave rise to the, that idea of religious liberty, that, uh, you know, just let the church lose something like what we have in this country, just let the church lose. As a matter of fact, they always admired this country. Uh, the and let it go on its own. Let everybody do whatever he wants religiously. This is where there's no establishment of the Catholic religion in France. Uh, that was uh, uh, 
what was known as liberal Catholicism, and there were people who, who promoted that, and quite a few people, uh, eminent, learned people that adhere to that in France. And I think that that mentality that we can get along with the revolution was learned from the Concordat, in my opinion. Now, I could be totally wrong on that. Certainly, Pius VII's intentions were sterling. That is, we want to preserve the faith in France and we want to somehow live with this monster Napoleon in France. We have to be nice and do whatever is necessary and make some concessions in order to restore the church in France. And uh, his, his, you know, of course, but I think his means were imprudent, in my opinion. Well, there's there, we're not going to get into every issue in the Concordat, but I suppose the nomination of bishops, this had been a right already conceded to the crown prior to this Concordat, but Napoleon wanted to have an even more aggressive stance on, on, on these bishops. And there is also the property question, all of the property that had been stolen during the re revolution. We can't say it's stolen anymore once we've signed the Concordat. Yes. Ironically, Napoleon restored to all of the nobility their confiscated properties, the properties that had been confiscated during the French Revolution. All of the aristocracy got, got those properties back. The church was given nothing back. And the, the, uh, the, all the properties of the church were considered to be state property at, at the disposition of the bishops. You see, and uh, uh, so, you know, that, that's, that's something intolerable for the Catholic Church. You can't give in to anything like that. It would be better to say mass in the woods or, or in hotels than to admit that, than to occupy churches that are owned by a Jacobin, you know, the devil himself. Uh, uh, no, you know, we, whatever we have to suffer, we will suffer, but we will keep Catholicism intact by suffering. We will not admit a, a watered-down Catholicism which wants to get along with the revolution, which ultimately is the cause of modernism. I mean, some of the moves he made just seemed hateful, just shaving off holy days of obligation that had been around for centuries in France and reducing them out. You know, what would a monarch uh, care about, about these sorts of things? But it was just an opportunity for him to flex his power uh, and his negotiating within this against the church. Well, Napoleon had this idea that I have to pacify France, that I, France has been upset for over a decade. And part of that pacification was to pacify the church, to make the French people happy that the Catholic Church is functioning again because it, it, the Catholic Church was, was completely destroyed uh, except for something like what we're living through now, saying mass in woods and places like that. It, you know, it, it depended on the period, but I mean, in the, in the worst part of it, uh, priests were hunted down and they were sent off to uh, Devil's Island in, uh, in South America, which was a death sentence, essentially. Uh, if they didn't go along with the Constitution, etc. Uh, so, you know, the, uh, the, he, it, people were upset about that. So pacifying the church was high on his list. Mussolini did the same thing. Mussolini was a, was a, a creep. But he uh, understood that the Catholic Church was very important in Italy, and therefore he made the Concordat, the Lateran Concordat, in 1929 with the church where the crucifixes would be in the in the classroom catholic religion would be taught in public schools and many other concessions to the catholic church it was just a, a way of pacifying france and then he'd violated as soon as the, he, he added some uh some other rules after consalvi left after the concordat was done he added on some things without any consent or even consultation with the pope and then he violated the, the very rules of the Concordat immediately. It's the, it's the rule, rule book for liberals, Your, your Excellency. Yes. You can add a prefatory note after the document, and <laughs> yes. then, but you have to put the prefatory note at the end with the footnotes. Yes. Yes. Well, as you say, this sets up the entire modern world, even though this episode is really only talking about 1789 to leading up to 1814. In our next episode, we're going to see the time-delayed bombs that would just keep exploding they're ex still ex exploding to our present day uh, you can you can see them in in uh, mostly peaceful protests uh, throughout the united states 
uh, that, that come from this revolution. So in our next episode, we'll talk about, as you alluded to, the Congress of Vienna, the restoration of sort of false, false dawn and leading up to the period of the First World War. Until then, thank you for your time, Your Excellency. Thank you. This program was brought to you free of charge by the sponsorship of Novus Ordo Watch. See for yourself that the Church of the Second Vatican Council is not in fact the Catholic Church of the Ages. Go to NovusOrdoWatch.org.